Hello, ladies and gents. We have the great pleasure today of doing an interview with Mr. Milo McKay. We'll be talking about psychotherapy, comedy, trauma, and the importance of vulnerability. What's your name? Carol. Carol. <laughs> is that with an E or is it Christmas? <laughs> uh, of course it bloody is. You're an eight. Oh. Eight's a fun-loving, rambunctious, generous of spirit. You have the life and soul, really. <laughs> No, no, no. You're not a 10. You're do you are either confusing this with me rating your looks. <laughs> it's happened before, John. Or you're using words with friends' values. Either way. You, you're a fucking eight. You're a fucking eight. Three. No, listen to me. Basta, cara, listen to me, you eight. Fucking three. One, 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 one. Is bastard. Eight. You're fucking eight. It was psychotherapy you studied at Liverpool, wasn't it? Um, I did psychology at uni. Yeah. Um, and then after a gap of a couple of years, I started doing a master's in psychotherapy. Right. Um, Which university did you Liverpool. Go to? You were at Liverpool. Uni. Yeah, uni of, yeah. Did you enjoy Liverpool. Uh, yeah, uni of Liverpool. Hey, uni of. Did, you, did you enjoy it here? I loved it here. And like, even now, um, I've been back here loads of times, but even now I'll go past the corner or something mm. and there'll be a ghost of the late nineties. Just, I'll yeah. sort of go, ah, and I'll just get this like- I threw up there. Yeah, no, literally. <laughs> down St. John's uh, shopping centre, I yeah. saw a corner where I threw up. It used to be an HMV and it, yeah. it's now a little coffee shop. Yeah. But yeah, you that little flashbacks. ghost. I've got lots of fond memories of Liverpool, yeah. yeah. Yeah, loved it. I loved being at uni and it was a brilliant part of my life. Yeah. Um, like my daughter now is mad into Harry Potter and mm. she's all, she, my eldest daughter, and she's talking about boarding school. Mm. And uh, and I'm like, uh, no. I said, do you see all that? The community, the dinners together. Like, You're mm. talking about university, and you know? That's what yeah. you want. Boarding school is nothing like that. It's so not. I've got a head on to uni. You know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, boarding uh, school is, I, well, I found it. How oh, did you go to boarding school? I went to boarding school, yeah. <gasps> Dreadful. Yeah. Oh, it looks like Harry Potter. I mean, yeah. like you're in old buildings with gargoyles hanging off them. Yeah, but yeah. Daily life. I mean, I, I did it in 91. And the, the people, I mean, there's a whole, we could do an analysis of all the people who work in that kind of an environment. Yeah. I was actually just thinking about one of my teachers from that boarding school called Mr. Stevens. We called him Shaken Steven, Shaky. He looks and, and sounded like... Um, your character, Troy Hawk. Oh, yeah, yeah. He even had the pencil thin mustache. Yeah. Because these people- Was he a wrong one? He was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah. was a wrong one. Yeah. He would take the goals to do rounders on his own and he'd, uh, he'd be off away on a distant field. Oh, and I was like, why do you take them down yeah. there, shaky? Yeah, um, yeah we, used to, we used to give him stick for that. But uh, it was this, the reason why I was thinking about it is there's like a preservation in time. It was like they're trapped in amber and mm. these types of people- who were in the 90s, you know, Public Enemy was was out and NWA was big, but they're still, the mind, even the clothes, I remember the clothes they used to wear. It was like the 60s and 50s for some of them, they're still stuck in that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was actually thinking about uh, about Shaky as, as I was on the way here. But you're, you're right, it's not it, that, that uh, what we think boarding school would be versus the actual reality of it. Yeah. Tell her I said no. You don't, uh, you don't, you don't want to do that. You I don't will. want to do that. Was there, um, so you you went from Liverpool and then you did a master's in psychotherapy? You yeah. Said. Yeah. So I did a, a, I did a practical master's. So mm. it was like, at the time I was a drummer in a band mm. and I'd sort of, after uni, I'd given myself a year or two because I thought that was what I wanted to do is become a, a drummer. Yeah. So I gave myself a year or two and then I thought, like... The drummer, you were a drummer in a band. This is the band that was associated with James, was it? Oh, no, it was... So I was... Tim Booth, mm. as the lead singer of James, mm. I met him in an acting class. Okay. And I didn't know who he was. Right. And uh, I just thought he was he was just this, like, nice hippie dude. Yeah. Like, this sort yeah. of, you know, mellow, kind of lovely guy. Mm. Um, and I was talking to him, I was in a cover band at the time and I right. was talking to him about like various gigs I've done and everything. Mm. And he needed a drummer mm. for his solo project, which was going out in mm. uh, the next year, like going on tour. And he's like, are you good at the drums? I'm like, yeah, mate, I'm good at the drums. He goes, so I'm looking for a drummer. And I'm like, well, 
I'll do this for a living. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Because I yeah. didn't have a clue. I, right. I thought it would be whatever the hell it would be from some random bald dude that you meet in an acting <laughs> class. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and then he played me the thing. As soon as I heard, as soon as I heard his voice, I was like, oh, and he goes, I knew you didn't know who I was. <laughs> and I was like, because he didn't know if I was just playing it like super cool. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I, you, I, you want a drummer, but I'm a professional. Exactly. <laughs> I'm the lead singer of James. Exactly. Oh, dear. Exactly. <laughs> Like, and that was, that was brilliant. That was like a brilliant little phase in my life uh, yeah. from about, when was that? Two, late 2003 to about 2005. Right. And, and then, then I was sort of getting into comedy and yeah, I, I realized that, oh, that, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Drumming wasn't what I wanted to do. This yeah. is, this is way better. So, so you were doing, you started to get into comedy back in 2005. Yeah, well, I was so bad though. Like as anyone is yeah. when they, well, most 95% of people are dreadful right. when they start comedy. What's what's interesting is what can happen is somebody can be too good at comedy at the start, so they mm. get this excellent five-minute set, mm. which then they take to competitions and everything mm. like that. And mm. so people see this brilliant five-minute set and they go, ah, oh, this guy, and they get a big agent straight away and they'll mm. win a competition with a five-minute set and they'll get punted right to the top mm -hmm. to a level of comedy they're not ready for at right. all. Because right. suddenly they've got to do 10s and 15s, which yeah. they don't have. And yeah. it takes a long time to develop it. Right. So some people can get a really good five, really good 10. They get pushed too fast and then it just sort of fizzles out. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, they're, not, I they're not tempered yet. They're not, no. they're not seasoned. Yeah, no, yeah. And, and like, so I was dreadful at the beginning. I got an agent pretty early on, but I was thrown right in the fire. Mm. So I sort of, it was really sink or swim. I didn't say, right, you're doing a, you know, 15 minute paid gig here after about my 10th gig. Wow. So it was intense. It yeah. was, it was hardcore, but <clears throat> sort of got through that stage and stuck so, with so you it. Would, you would, you're saying you were really bad. I presume it's not false modesty. You oh, would no. go out, do a set yeah. and people would be going, you stink. No, no, but that, that's, <laughs> a, there's a difference. People, you, you can have a comic yeah. who you can get a reaction mm. and you can kind of fake it a bit and you can convince a crowd six mm. times out of 10, maybe that yeah. you're okay. You can get away with it. Because they're drunk. They want to laugh. They were, they're there with yeah. you. Yeah. You're still objectively a bad comedian. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No, I know exactly you're what you still mean. still like... I know exactly what you mean. Not... Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? You're, yeah. You're not anywhere near yeah. the level of, ex, you know, really good at your craft. Yes. You're just, you're just not. You can get away with it. You can get away with, with tricks, with, yeah. you know personality and yeah. so on. And I think a lot of that, that was how I was in the beginning. And in, in the beginning, I think I just, I just craved being able to do it as opposed to actually honing the craft. Right. And being technically good and sort of expressing myself. Okay. At the beginning, it was just like, I made them laugh. I can feel good about myself. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I'd, I've never done stand up, but I used to do, uh, I used to work in schools and I was an external contractor. I was on PGCE. Yeah. And so you would, you'd be forced, you were in a position where you needed kids to pay attention. And so I did develop sort of a stand up comedy routine for 16 year olds and it worked yeah. because I was getting laughs. So I started thinking I was funny. I wasn't funny. <laughs> I just had a series of jokes that would make bored sixteen-year-olds laugh. Yeah, and it's like you say, it's not, it's not the same thing. Yeah, yeah. you're not, uh, you're not seasoned. Mm. And if you get a bad crowd, or you're, if you're seasoned, it's like being a fighter, isn't it? And yeah, you yeah. do do some martial arts. I do. You? Well, I'm, I'm really into boxing. Like, oh, really? Yeah, I, awesome. I've, I've done a few. I've done a few things. I did like. Um, I did like Krav for a bit. I did BJJ for a bit a long time ago, but boxing was the one that really took with me. Right. Um, I just love sort of honing all the techniques and yep. it's the little adjustments. It's like comedy. It's little adjustments you can make that mm. suddenly make you more powerful with less effort. Yeah. That's when it gets really addictive for me when suddenly right. you're turning your weight into something and it's effortlessly sort of popping off the pad or yeah. whatever. Yeah, well, yeah, I love boxing. I could, I, I could see a lot of crossover um, between the two arts, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I wanted to ask you about it, but there is this issue of uh, seasoning, and you have to go through a period where you suck. I think. Yeah, yeah. And you like for a long time, you yeah. should suck for a really long time yeah. and keep going. Yeah. With it. Uh, I, I. I started doing door work in a comedy club and it turned me into a comedy Which snob. Which one? Uh, it's the Life Cafe on Bold Street. I don't know if right. you know, that it's That's like 2006, 2007. Yeah, no, um, I know. It turned into a post office and yeah. it became different things. 
But I started, um, started to become a bit of a snob. Not that I've ever done comics. I have no right to be a fucking snob. Yeah, yeah. But what you're saying about comics who aren't that good but can make the crowd laugh, I'm, there are huge comics who are like that. Not naming any names, yeah, yeah, but some obviously. really famous comics. Yeah. But people don't know. Yeah. It seems like the majority of people don't know. Yeah. That uh, Russell Howard's actually not funny. Um, <laughs> I said it. You didn't say it. <laughs> There's no consequence to me. But but he's doing what you're talking about, which is a bit of character, mm. silly voice, one joke, two jokes, and you're like, but this is this is not this yeah. is not a seasoned. This is not skillful. I think I, I don't know. I've not maybe. Um, yeah, it's it, it's hard, isn't it? Because it's it's it's. I guess comedy is incredibly subjective, isn't it? But within yourself, like within myself as a as a performer, I'll sort of look back at 2009 or mm. whatever, and, and at that time mm. I was smashing gigs and I thought I was terrific, mm. you know. But now I look back and I sort of wince. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'm like, oh, do you, you, do you have video clips from then? Uh, not, I, I think I do s somewhere, yeah. Mm. But I remember the really good, uh, I've said this before in a podcast, but I, I used to do this other character and it used to kill. And I was like in at the comedy store and everything. Mm. And then this, this comic said to me, I don't get it. Why are you doing that character? And I was like, well, I smashed it tonight. I took mm. the roof off. And he goes, mm. yeah, but why are you doing it? Would you laugh at that? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and then he, did, he absolutely did me, but he did me such a solid as a friend. Yeah. Because it made me go, and there was another comedian or two who only took that risk of saying something to me like that that could offend me mm. with no real benefit to them. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. if I'm arsed with them and I'm like, oh, that bloke's an arsehole. But no, mm. they've, they've said, I don't get why you're doing that. I don't think it's that. I like you, but I don't think it's that comically valid. Yeah. That really hurts, but it's such an important thing to hear because yeah. they've only told me that because they like me. Yes. They've only told me that. They've taken a risk and, and given me some feedback, which has made me go, hmm, yeah. And it's those little things that then go, all right, I need to do something that I would laugh at. Mm -hmm. I need to I need to write something that actually I, I'm expressing myself and I'm enjoying myself. Whereas before, it was kind of like all I wanted mm. was – to get that reaction from a crowd, mm. to feel good enough about myself that mm. I could float through the next three days. Yeah. Feeling... Narcissistic elation. Feeling <laughs> the elation of a crowd giving me all this approval that yeah. I obviously crave because I'm a comedian in the first <laughs> fucking place. <laughs> and like, it was give that. Me hit, give yeah, me my hit. Yeah, it was that. And it was like, I, I, if I had a, a, a gig and it went badly, mm. that's my next couple of days fucked. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's it it was very much like that. And and it's different now, I think, because now I'm more tuned into sort of improving and honing and I'm a bit more tuned into the actual practicality of what I'm doing and and, right. and making that better. Yeah. You know. I'm, I I I think um it's uh it, because the crowd isn't going to give you that hard feedback. It has to come from other stand-up comics, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean the crowd is going to give you that hard feedback if you if you really stink. If you really stink, but this thing you're talking about where the crowd's going, it's, yeah, you're great. The comics, the comics analysis is a higher level analysis, right? Right. It's right. like, where is this going to go? <laughs> okay. How are you going to progress this? What is this going to lead to? Yeah. And if you don't have an answer for those, then mm. they've asked you a brilliant. They've asked you some brilliant questions. Yes. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Because yeah. you just, you just, what are you doing? Just treading water. Just, you've got to come, like, I've got a real thing about evolving and getting better all the time. Mm. Like a constant sort of being better in, in whatever way, in whatever way you can, at whatever you can yeah. than, than you were like last month or, you know, or, or, all of this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, comedy and boxing are both uh, are two things which really fall into that. There's like these little adjustments you can keep making to improve. Well, I, I always, uh, I, I relate, um, I work a lot at the talk about narcissistic personality disorder a lot. And I know people who are diagnosed yeah. narcissist, narcissistic personality disorder. Funny. Yeah. Super funny. Yeah. But funny like boxers because they'll get you, they'll hit you with something and the jab gets through the guard and you're laughing more than you should be. And they're yeah. like, oh, you find this funny. Yeah. Then they come again. They come again. They go high, they go low. And if they catch you on like a, like a good combination, 
they can actually have you rolling around on the floor. I've only ever known people with narcissistic personality to do that. But they seem. How, how do you mean? Just 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 taking the piss out of you, or um, it could be take. I, I quite like I, I quite like getting roasted. Really? I like people taking the piss out of me. It makes me laugh a lot. But it could be anything. Yeah. Like they just. I think because they have, they're more attuned to people, so they they they're scanning you all the time. They're looking for weaknesses. They're looking for vulnerabilities. And in a way, the stuff you find funny is a kind of vulnerability. So you know, uh, when you're boxing with somebody, they hit you, mm. and then they hit you based on your next reaction. They're not just doing a dead combo. Yeah, they hit you, and they go, "How did you respond?" Oh, and there we now, go. And yeah, now yeah. we go. And now we go. And I've seen that with people with with narcissistic personality disorder. Mm. I did the trigonometry podcast a couple of weeks ago. They're both uh, comedians, uh, Constantine and Francis. And I was saying there is, in the best way possible, I mean, I'm, I'm a public speaker and this is this is my job. Mm. There is something close to narcissism because I think- Of course. We have a sense of, of people's responses, of right? Of course, yeah. of course. And that's the interesting thing for me is that how do you, like, where's the line between narcissistic tendencies mm -hmm. um, and- personality disorder right do you know what i mean because i think i've uh, i've got um i've definitely got narcissistic tendencies mm -hmm. i think my whole family has mm -hmm. um my whole nuclear family like my you know um my dad uh i thought when i was growing up because obviously when i was studying psychotherapy i had to have psychotherapy myself for the first time okay and i was like i was like 25 and i'm like Oh, you know, I don't need this. I'm, mm. I'm going, this is like whatever. And then as I got into it, um, mm. I, I, I realized that the negative interject, mm -hmm. the voice in my head that I took for granted mm -hmm. was actually a deletable piece of software, which right. was stunning. And it was like life changing. Mm. So over time, this idea that, oh, that voice in my head, always second guessing me, questioning me that I can just get rid of that at any time. Can I? Right. Are you King kidding me like <laughs> and i had this excellent psychotherapist and she sort of took me through uh all of it like when i started i've got a massive i did transactional analysis right awesome i'm in transactional you're, you're analysis in that. Yeah, yeah. at the moment weekly right. transactional analysis right. therapy yeah it's great so <laughs> i i have had a be perfect driver right 100 percent. like which is where everything has to obviously you know everything has to be perfect mm. and if it isn't uh, then, you know, you're beating yourself up and stuff. Mm. Uh, the offshoot of that is you get good at shit. Mm. The, the the other side of it is everything feels a bit empty because there's no end goals. So you never mm. reward yourself and, mm -hmm. and, and all this kind of thing. So my be perfect driver was so strong. When I went into psychotherapy for the first time ever, I was like, I'm going to be the best client this woman's ever had. <laughs> I am going to hit her with everything. Yeah, I feel that. I'm, I'm going to be an open book. Right? I went into therapy. that first session. I was like, <laughs> This, this lovely little old lady yeah. in her front room, I'm like, right, right, yeah, pornography, womanizing, blah, 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 blah. Here's everything that's bad about me. Look at me, I'm an open book. And I go, talk nonstop at her for 50 minutes. She didn't say one word. Right. Didn't say one word. <laughs> Don't even think she wrote anything down. <laughs> and I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And, all right, fine. Went away, next session, came in. All right, okay, how about this? More womanizing, more pornography. Here's why I'm an awful person. There's a, here's yeah. all the things there. Like, yeah. da, 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 da. And again, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. I'm walking away and I'm going, what is this? <laughs> what the fuck is this, right? I went for my third session and I was a bit tired yeah. and I had nothing. Right. And I sat there and I just went, and we sat there in total silence for 50 minutes. Right. And then I went, well, that was that was shit, wasn't it? <laughs> she went, no. <laughs> she goes, that was your best session. Right. I was like, what are you talking about? She goes, that's the first session that you've been present at. Right. Because this, that was the first session where you actually just were how you are. And then I, nice. I, I kind of went, oh, yeah. and I started to trust her. And yeah. I was like, oh, this lady, this lady know what she's doing. Mm. So as we're going along, like over the course of six to nine months, I divine with her that my negative interject, and I had a really strong one. I had a, like, every time I was talking to someone, oh, you've made it twat yourself. Oh, they right. think you're a compl Have you seen the way that person's looking at you? Yeah took it for granted that this was hardwired in me, in yeah. everybody, yeah. not something I'd ever really talked about, yeah. but but something I occasionally had tried to fruitlessly argue with because I didn't know how to. Right. And then I'd sort of unpack it a little bit 
and we get through it. And my my, my dad had a very traumatic childhood, mm. and he hermetically sealed his emotions at the age of eight. Right? right, so not much gets in, not much gets out. It was around seven, eight. He was like, okay, I'm a self sort of working organism mm. ecosystem. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I look mm. after myself. That's mm. it. Bang, because of trauma and stuff. And then I worked out that. He'd been my hero. He's a comedian as well, by the way. So there's uh, so much okay. to dig okay. into here. <laughs> so I become a comedian, but I become a character comedian. So right. I've got a layer because, of, uh, right, there's yeah. so much of that. Yeah. But 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 essentially, my dad was my hero and I idolised him and everything. And then as I was getting older, I was like, I'm, I'm getting nothing back here. What the fuck? Mm. You know? And so I realised that, that his not paying attention to me manifested in my head as this lack of worth, this lack of self-worth, which which fueled the negative interjects. Mm -hmm. And I got this book called Trapped in the Mirror, which was about children of self-absorbed parents. And I was literally on every every single page, which mm -hmm. was just stunning. And um, I had a, eventually, I, I, was, I was about a year into psychotherapy and I, I confronted my dad and I had this chat with him. And I just let him have it. I just, I, I just was totally honest. And this is how I know my dad hasn't got narcissistic personality disorder. Because mm. um, at one point I thought he might do, but he mm. doesn't because mm. I told him all this. And he looked at me and, and he looked me in the eye and it felt like the first time he'd properly looked me in the eye. Mm. And his voice went back to an eight-year-old, mm. right? Mm. right? And he just went, I'm so sorry. Mm. He goes, I've, I'm so sorry. And we had this massive hug. Mm. And if it wasn't for that, like like ever since that moment, I think that was a hard moment for my dad. Mm. Um, but at the same time, me and him, we've had troubles since. It's not been brilliant since, but right now me and him have as good a relationship as we could both hope for. Yeah. And he's done that amazing thing of getting into his 60s and he's a stubborn kind of like typical stubborn Irish dad, mm. you know, like four brothers. Mm. Very, but as even he's got into his 60s and I've pushed him, he's mm. got to the point where he's he's learned to apologise. Wow. He's learned to take responsibility for stuff. Mm. And uh, it's not been easy for him. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But mm. he's he's learned to do that. And, and, uh, but a lot of that is we'll be tearing into each other and having an, an argument. And I'll go, you know, all right, like here's where I'm wrong. Here's where I fucked up. You know, I've done this wrong. I've done that, and and I'll sort of lay out all my shit, and then he'll, you know, he'll 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 give it back as well, mm -hmm. and and we've got more of an openness and a sort of communication now. And I think if I hadn't had that psychotherapy and worked that stuff out, yeah, then we wouldn't have that. And the other bonus was, um, over time, I got to shut down my negative interject as well, mm -hmm. like like reduce it dramatically. Mm -hmm. And and if you can get rid of that hectoring voice. Mm -hmm. I think it's one of the most powerful things you can do in 100%. in your life. Mm. Personally speaking, like mm -hmm. that's the end of level bad guy, I think. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't go away forever, does it? Uh if it if it does, I haven't experienced that. Nah. Turning it turning it down a little bit, moving it around a little bit, that's that's been about as good as it's got yeah. for me. Yeah. yeah. Um did you ever after these experiences, did you ever feel a drive to to do psychotherapy with other people? Or to... I, well, I, I had, um, yeah, I had clients. I, okay. I, so I was a student psychotherapist. Mm. And I'll be honest, in the, so it was a four-year course. And when I started the course, um, it was a four-year course, but it was like one weekend a month mm -hmm. for the first year, one mm -hmm. weekend a month. And I mm -hmm. got in the course and I looked around and I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is the most left field group of people I've ever met. Like more so than comics. Do you know what I mean? Like you see, you're, you're looking around at a sample group of, and you're like, really? Like, oh my gosh. This is where all the healing and guidance will come from. Wow. Are you kidding? <laughs> it was like a Monty Python sketch. Yeah. So I was looking around there. And just go, what the fuck? <laughs> However, uh, at the end of the first year, I had an interview with the, the dude and he's like, How, how's the cause? And I was like, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, and he goes, mm. okay, you're good to progress the next year. And I was mm. like, oh, does everyone not go through the next year then? Mm. And they just go, no. And I came back and the next year, half the class was was gone. Right. Which was like, okay, mm. yeah, all right, I get it. Mm. And then in the second year, you're a sh you, you, you've got the one weekend a month, but then you've got, uh, you, you are a student psychotherapist. Right. So I had three clients every Monday, mm. so three hours. Mm. And then you, you have those and then you go to somebody who monitors your work. Mm -hmm. So you then go and talk to someone for an hour a week about what you're doing mm -hmm. with those clients. Mm -hmm. 
and you'd have psychotherapy yourself. Yeah. Obviously. What's, what's that called? Oh, uh, I can't remember. It was I, like... I've just handed over the amnesia to you. It's, it's like oversight or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever some, that is. something like It'll that. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. And I had... Um, yeah, I, I remember there was... I had three clients mm. and I managed to get somewhere with two of them mm-hmm. and one of them I got nowhere with. And it, it was it was beautiful. Like um, th- there was one lady. I think I can talk about this, can't I? It's not. Yeah, you can. Know, if you're yeah. not naming names. You're, no, I'm you're not fine. naming names. Yeah. So there's one lady and um, she was very stern and, and her job, she was literally like a copywriter. So she, she corrected things mm-hmm. for, for a living. Ah. And she was, ve- you know, she was very kind of uptight and worried and, mm. you know, and she was finding things wrong with what I did and mm. so on. But I was at the point where I had I'd excellent supervision. So Supervision. That's yeah, it, right? <laughs> yeah. I had, that's it. I had excellent supervision. So mm. she was like, I was taking all this and she's like, this is all projecting. Mm. Write it out. Mm. It's cool. She's not having a go at you. It's just yeah. what she does. So we wrote it out. We wrote it out. And she started to sort of mellow out. And we were supposed to have a six month um period where mm. we, we we saw him for six months and then that was it mm. so we got towards the six months and i was like i'm feel like we're starting to get somewhere i don't want to i'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna tell her it's over i'm just right. gonna get me home so then three weeks later she comes in and she's furious mm. and she's like she's like we should have finished we are six months period. I drove and I said, "Yeah, I know, I know it's over, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to stop." Yeah. And then she like goes, "All right, you, you don't hate this." <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, no, no. I'm, I'm actually really. I feel like we're getting somewhere. Yeah. And she goes, "Do you mean that you don't hate me?" And I'm like, "No." And yeah. she just burst into tears, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, and it was amazing. And then we started getting this work done. Because she she trusted me and trusted the environment and right. and it was it was just the most phenomenal feeling mm. to be able to do that mm. with someone. Do you mm. know what I mean? And we mm. were sort of together another three months, and I know I made a, a, a difference with this lady, and I helped her. Mm. Um, and there was this other there was this other dude mm. who would just go on rambles and tangents, and mm. and it was so exhausting. And I was mm. I was like, I'd have to have like two coffees before his sessions. And I was like trying to follow him down every segue and every time. Yeah. And then one day he was doing it like twice as hard as normal. And I just had to stop him and I say, mm. I have to be honest with you, I, I lost you 10 minutes ago. Yeah. I had to really be honest. I had to yeah, go, yeah, yeah. I completely lost you 10 minutes ago. Yeah. And I said, and it's particular today mm. that, that this is happening. Mm. And I'm wondering if, there is actually something that you're not saying that you want to say. So mm. I, t- I took a leap of faith basically because yeah. I thought I could really upset him here. Yeah. And again, mm. I trusted my instincts and it was one of those where he went ah, and he stopped and then he actually started right. opening up about. And and suddenly I was completely a thousand percent engaged with what he was saying because right. he was being um, he was being in the room. He was being yeah. present, present, vulnerable. He was being yeah. present. Yeah, yeah, he was He was actually saying stuff that communicated. Yeah. Like, it's really hard to listen to people if they're talking a load of shite. Yeah. And it's it's just a gas cloud of distraction. It is it is boring. You will drift off. But that's the point, isn't it? They but want that, you to drift off. But, but yeah, but then there is that thing where like, why are they doing that? I guess, but that that's what takes the time, doesn't it? Like mm. I didn't, I didn't sort of do enough. I didn't, cause, cause I only did it for a year mm. and then I stopped to do other things. And I mm. thought to myself, I can get back into this when I'm, when I'm older, if, mm. if, if I want to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. I was, I, I think I was like 27 or 28 when I was doing it's, it. It's young for that. Yeah. It's super like. Yeah. I was like the, the, I think you can start that course when you're 25 and I think I started on 25. Yeah. Yeah. You need, I, I, I know, for, well, I was still doing door work when I was, when I was 27 round, round Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and there is like a, there's a there's a toughness and a groundedness that you did. That you comes, work with Darren Smith then? I would have been working when he was working, right? But I'd, yeah, I was working around Liverpool in uh, 2003 to 2009, right? Um, Where does he work? What bars do you work? 
I worked on the living room and the Mosquito. Um, I don't, would, would you have been in Liverpool when they were? That was the that was the club to go to back in I back guess, in the two thousands. I guess I would have been like. I Which was, comedy clubs were you coming to here? at the time? Around then, probably like Baby Blue. Oh, okay. On the docks. Yeah, Baby Blue was like the counterpart. That's where yeah. the doorman from our place in the barn. We'd go there on a Sunday night. We right. go down Baby Blue. Yeah. So yeah. you were doing the comedy gigs there, yeah. were you? Yeah, they had a good yeah. R and B night afterwards, didn't they? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember good enough. nights in baby blue. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, that, that thing that you're talking about, I think uh, when you've got clients who are doing that, I think it's just intellectualization. They're really scared of how they feel. Yeah. You've got a fella who's in with you, you've got a man with another man. Mm. Maybe he's not, he doesn't want to open up. And um, But I think it's only with time, like, yeah. And with more clients and with age, you can sort of get hold of somebody and go, listen, yeah. I know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Stop. And it is instincts, isn't it? Yeah. Like the more you trust instincts. that. And and because I, I ran this all by the supervisor and I, I went mm. in and I was like, look, I took this big risk. Mm. I know I shouldn't have done it, but mm. this is what I did. And she's like, no, you. that's the stronger you trust that instinct, the more the more powerful it gets. It's like, yeah. the more you trust it, it's more of a divining rod, isn't it? For sure. Part of me did worry though. Like, it's like, I'm fascinated by the way the brain works, but like I am like, is that also a part of narcissism going, Oh, I can fix you. I can, I can heal these people. I'm strong enough to sort of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like it could be, I don't it? know. It's like a God complex thing, isn't it? Yeah. Like yeah. Oh, I can, I can heal with my, you know, it can be the flip side. It's such a, it's such a like minefield. <laughs> it, it's, it's really, <laughs> you know tricky. I mean? it's really tricky. Cause you don't know whether you're the, the sort of the, the Jungian idea, the shadow, you don't know if your shadow is going to infect them. If yeah. you're going to toxically infect them with something, but it can be uh codependent. It can be the mirror image of narcissism where you're like, I have to save this person. Yeah. If I save them, I'll save the wounded inner child in me. Yeah. And then it becomes like this ne neurotic drive, mm. which is hard to overcome because you've got it. You have to have the boundaries to be able to say, okay, this is a separate adult. They have their own choices and I might not be able to help them. Yeah. And that's it. That's, that's life. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, you need that softness and vulnerability, the intuition, but you need the toughness also to, to have the distance. Yeah. Um, I cut you off when you were about to say something before. Is I it can't gone? remember. I think I cut you off, didn't I? Where has Troy Hawk come from? Oh, yeah, <laughs> I know, yeah. I know you have to answer this question yeah. all the time, but um, no, it's fine. How, how was how was he born? It's fine. So, um, I was doing a uh, like a, a show in Edinburgh when I had to do four characters, and I had three of them, and I needed one more for this like fifteen minute section. And my manager at the time said, "Why don't you do a posh character? There's not really any posh characters about." And I'd really had a thing for like David Niven and the old Parkinson interviews. So I just watched, I read David Niven's book and I watched the Parkinson's interviews. And I was right. like, right, I want this guy, David Niven, in a modern age. Like I want it to be a four dimensional character. I don't want to be just doing a, a, a monologue to the crowd. I want to yeah. be able to interact. So I want a backstory that legitimizes this guy mm -hmm. in today's era. Mm -hmm. So... I had, funnily enough, Troy is the son of a, a, a shut-in son of a narcissistic mother right. who has p preserved him in the era that she most enjoyed. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. So so this character has been born of an urge to please his narcissistic mother kind of thing. Right. Right. So that's the backstory. So he's, he's grown up in a hermetically sealed bubble and then just mm. out in the world kind of thing. Candles, square mounts, read about bayons. All for a pound. You found it, did you say you found a pound on the floor? Yeah. Suddenly this place has turned into a world of opportunity. You can buy literally anything in here. Well, no, there's stuff up here for three pounds. I thought everything was supposed to be a pound. Suddenly, this equalitarian paradise has turned into a two tiered hierarchical nightmare. It's like North Korea in here. I thought everything was supposed to be a pound. I dare not. Good Lord, people need to be warned. Uh, madam, it, it, not everything in here is a pound. Some are five or seven. Just watch your back. It says everything's a pound. No, I'm not all right. right. But yeah, as soon as I started doing it, I was like, oh, this is fun. Mm. I can have a bit of fun with this. This is more fun than the other character I was doing. Mm. So uh, I, was, I, I did it in the show and it was just a 10 minute chunk. And I just went, do you know what? Like the character I was doing in the clubs, I'd got pretty far. I was in at the comedy store. I was sort of closing a lot of gigs and everything. I was like, I'm, I'm just going to bring this guy mm. instead. I took a lot of risks and it wasn't quite ready, 
But I was at that point where I was like, I've got to do it. I'm not excited about this. I'm excited about that. I've got, yeah. and I lost gigs and I, I sort of, I went from closing to kind of opening and middling. Like yeah. I, I, I started earning less money, but I was like, I've got, I've got to push forward with this because it's more exciting and it's, yeah. you know, I can't do it if it's not exciting. Absolutely. And then, yeah, just, 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 just focused on it, ground in, kept doing it, made it work. How, how, how many years has he been around for? Um, when did I first do it? So I first did it in a show in Edinburgh in 2012. And then I think probably since about 2014, properly. 2014. Yeah. 2014 was when I was like, right, I'm totally doing this now. I, I wondered if you were going to show up today with the moustache because I thought it was I thought it was real. Yeah, I it was a I've got mustache. I've got really good at drawing it on. Okay, but it's it's nice. Like there's there's obviously there's a lot of psychology to that because mm. what I really enjoy is most of the time I can w wipe it off, mm. t take all the gear off, mm. muss my hair up. Mm kind of reduce my aura yeah. <laughs> and then just walk through the crowd pretty much incognito, yeah. which is nice. Yeah. And it's it's nice for me to be able to have that separation as well. Mm. Mm. It's, uh, they, it is, it, I think it, it makes it easier being a, a character act than a regular stand up in some ways. Yeah. And it makes it more difficult in others. I think it's definitely a trade off. Do you know so, what I mean? So you're limiting what you can and can't do, but then through that limitation, it sort of forces a level of creativity on you, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, but but also I think there's an emotional barrier as right. well. Right. Do, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, between you and the crowd? I think between me and... I don't know between me and the crowd. I don't think there's an emotional barrier between me and the crowd because okay. I feel like... I'm channeling something legitimate to them. Okay. so But I think the barrier is more between me personally yeah. and the, the, not the crowd. What is it? What is it? Is it an internal boundary? It's a I think it's a safety thing. It's mm. like, it's not me out there. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm not going out there. It's like I've got two, en I've got two separate sort of entities. So, mm. Troy is going out there and 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 if Troy does well, obviously I feel great. Mm. If Troy does badly, I feel bad. Mm. But the, the, there's a, I'm my it's not my identity. It's yeah. not me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So it might be a, like a safety blanket from yes. my perspective. Yeah. Um but I, I started doing stand up as me and I was fine and yeah. I was making it work. I wasn't good. Yeah. But I would I'm more authentic as Troy. That's what I wanted to ask you. Um, I'm more authentic as Troy okay. than I ever was as me as a stand-up in the early days. Definitely. Okay. Which I was is... I was doing things that I thought people would find funny. And if a comedian works on that principle, they're never going to be massive. Yeah. Because they're not channeling their individual, you know, the thing that makes them funny and right. brilliant. Their, their individual ideas, their yeah. worldview, the thing that makes them stand out. Yeah. Through Troy, I can kind of do that with mm. more my more left field ideas. Mm. There is there is a lot of me in there. Like there's a lot of my mum in there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? There's a the, 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 it, it's not. Yeah, I think that would be where the barrier is. I think it's sort of more like an emotional protection thing right. for me, my identity, all that kind of thing. There's there's a there's a, a psychoanalytically trained philosopher I like from Slovenia called Slavoj Žižek. Don't know if you've heard of him, but he would always say that there's more truth in the character yeah. than in the real person. Yeah. So uh, Batman isn't really Bruce Wayne. Yeah. That that human being would be Batman. The yeah. Joker, you don't want to unmask the Joker and find out his backstory. Yeah, yeah. That's completely, that's not, he is that character. Yeah. That's the real him yeah. is the character. Not like, oh, I finished being Troy. So yeah. you, so you are Troy then? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. The elements of, yeah, definitely. I think there's something, I, I love Troy. Thank you. And um, I think, there's something close to perfect about him as a stand-up comedy character because he is so, uh, the narcissistic barrier, his self-certainty is impenetrable. Mm. And that's wonderful. Yeah. Even though you're only pretending. Um, I'm Troy 
after a fat line of cocaine. <laughs> I become Troy York <laughs> for about 15 minutes. I, I go back into English private school boy. That's it. Incredibly pompous, yeah. incredibly self-certain. I've got a bit about that. No, should, no yeah. reflection whatsoever. Yeah. Like, this is the way it is. And I yeah. don't want to hear, <laughs> start pointing at people. Yeah, I've, I've got a bit, I've, I've, I've got a bit about that at the moment where basically that's what cocaine is. It's like private education in a bag. It's like it one is. line, you're an eating eating old boy for 15 minutes you get just a taste of that life do you know what i mean (laughs) did you did you go through uh the public uh, were you private school educated no i I went to a grammar school um but but i think uh, as i've gotten older and i've seen like i've got friends who went who were privately educated yeah and i've met their friends yeah and i've i used to work in i used to be a percussionist that like um house clubs okay. and i worked in some clubs in london like uh funky buddha and amica oh yeah and what was the other one it was another club in the early noughties that was there so i met lots of that yeah. set right. private educated and i was stunned by the, <laughs> they are the vibrations yep. of their personalities yes. the egos <laughs> the certainty <laughs> and it's like that that gets drilled into you, presumably. Yes. When you're 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 privately educated, yeah. you are above. You are the elite. Yeah. You stand above, and and it, it it gets downloaded into your brain. Yeah. Um, and kind of gives you that. To put it in transactional analysis terms, I'm okay. You're not okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Which the, which the is of a, narcissism. But, <laughs> But that's got that, that that's got so many sort of pitfalls along the way yeah, for yeah. that person to have oh, yeah. that mindset. Yes, yeah. Th- th- there's so many negative things that come with that. Oh yeah, like it's no, a, it's not a only the fact that you're an asshole, yeah. but I mean for you, <laughs> like I'm okay, you're not okay. Is a seesaw that just fucks you. You, in yeah, the yes, yeah. You know, yeah. the the only uh, the only people I know, well, there's a, there's a guy who's diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder who I work with, yeah, and he has a system for helping people overcome narcissistic personality disorder that relies on that principle. He's an MPD. He's, he's got MPD. He's got MPD. And he's a mate of yours. Yeah, he's a professor of psychology. So, so he's got MPD and he's aware he's got MPD. So, he's, so how, yeah. how does how does that affect his... Well, he's, he's, he's very, very high IQ. Yeah. Um, he has borderline personality disorder and he's been diagnosed with psychopath as well. So he has a, a host of mental health issues. Yeah. Um, but the way I relate to him is narcissistically. It's my private school. So I had teachers like him. I had professors like him. They're gods. And you take the bounty of their infinite wisdom and you're polite and you're grateful. So I have no problem. Private school really helped with that. And uh, we have... Yeah, we have a good, we have a really warm, friendly, happy relationship. But yeah, he's 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 MPD. (laughs) But his system for helping people overcome NPD relies on that realization that you've just given, which is it, NPD is like a coping mechanism. It's a trauma response. Hmm. And the NPD person will think, oh, this is the way to be in the world. But as you've just said, it's catastrophic for the yeah. individual. You're losing so much. Yeah, yeah, because your relationship forming and stuff like that, I'm okay, you're not okay. Mm. That's every relationship is a minefield. Mm. Every relationship is sort of doomed to failure Yeah, unless you, you correct that balance. 100%. 100%. Like you're going to essentially consciously or subconsciously gaslight your partner mm-hmm. and make them feel like shit to put them in that because you're going to naturally put them in that you're not okay category mm-hmm. to maintain this balance that you have in your head and yeah it's a, it's a purely vertical dynamic they can't yeah. do horizontal fair dynamics it has to be exploitative when does, i was I got, go does he does he apologize your mate he's got mpd uh if he did something wrong yes. would he apologize yes he would apologize yes what do you mean it um, within the within the paradigm of the because he has to play chess with normal humans and with himself. So within the paradigm of of that game of chess, yes, he yeah. is sorry. Like if he causes offence or because naturally, if the more time we're spending with each other, the, mm. the more likely that is to happen. Mm. But yeah, yeah. What about people that can't apologise for anything? You know, you know the type, yeah. and it's generally because they're so brittle mm. fundamentally inside. Mm that them acknowledging a mistake is almost too much pain for them to personally bear. 
that, they, they would have a very low resolution understanding of their personality disorder or no acknowledgement of it. Mm. So the difference with him is he has a super high resolution understanding of that. So he, he's aware he's grandiose. He's aware he can't reflect very well. Mm. So the, the, yeah, the, the normal person with MPD will not apologize. Won't apologize. Cannot. Won't take it and will flip whatever it is back on you, making it your fault. And uh, I'm so sorry that you feel that way. Yeah. I'm so sorry that this tiny thing I did made you so upset because you're so hypersensitive. That's the apology. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, and and you think that generally with people with MPD, that's like a defense mechanism, like, yeah. It's, it's as I understand it, it's a response to a really painful, really traumatic childhood. Um, and it's to sort of feed yourself grandiosity, feed yourself, grand I'm wonderful. Mm. Not just I'm a good person, that's no good. I need the hard Peruvian flake cocaine of I am godlike, I am amazing. Apologizing is fucking wonderful though. Like, like if you, for me, I, I was talking, I, I think you might be similar. It's like the idea of continually evolving. How can you do that if you don't acknowledge your own fuck ups and you don't yeah. stand in that and yeah. sort of go, all right, like I've screwed this up. I'm sorry. Like that's, surely that's the route to, you know what I mean? Yes. Like, it's, like it's working life, your yeah. shit out. 100%. And, and it's, a, it's amazing as well. Like, and I do it myself sometimes as I forget how important vulnerability is. Mm especially just meeting someone and laying something out. Mm. Like my mum died in uh, July, 2019. And I was like, right, I'm gonna, I, 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 I was straight to work that night. Cause it was, it was like a long term. She had a long term illness. So mm. I knew it was coming, mm -hmm. right? But the immediate reaction wasn't instant. I had like five years of slow burn grief. Yeah. And straight away it was kind of relief for her cause she was in yes. so much pain and everything. Yeah. So I was like, all right, on the day, fine. Like, yeah. let's just, let's just carry on through whatever. I had an Edinburgh show I was mm. about to do. Did a show that night, you know, mm. drove to Swindon that night, did a show with some guy. Mm. And then I was like, I'm going to put off the grieving till mm. after Edinburgh, this boot camp intense performance thing, like, sh you know, how long, three shows every night, whatever. Mm. And then about a week in, um, I, I, I was at this um, package gig where mm. you, uh, it's like a, a mixed bill gig. So there's mm. loads of acts on. And the MC was on the stage and he wasn't very good. He was woefully bad, in fact. And he was taking the goodwill of the crowd and just boiling it down and reducing it like an overcooked sauce. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> just, just turning it. In. It was so perfect. Leaving you with a stinking crust. <laughs> yeah. And, and I turned around and there was this balsa wood changing room. I was like, I'm going to punch a hole in that balsa. I'm going to punch a hole straight through that. Mm. And I saw myself do it. And I was like, wait, there's probably someone sat right the other side. And that's going to be a bad start to the fucking show. Just a fist coming out of it. But I, I was like, all right, I'm doing that thing I know I do, which yeah. I'm turning my sadness into anger mm. because anger's easier to fucking control. Yeah, yeah. Anger, you're, you're doing it instead yeah. of sadness, which is happening to me. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So I was like, okay, I've got to start talking to people. And then everyone who asked me how I was, mm. I'd tell them. Right. I'd be like, I'm, sh I'm shit, mate. My mom died like three weeks ago mm. and I'm turning all my sadness into anger. How are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm sorry that that's funny, but it, it, yeah, it, is, it is. Of course it is. But like, <laughs> what's well, here I found, nine out of 10 people went, oh, all right, well, here's this shit thing that's happened to me. Lovely. Yep. And then yep. I, I've laid out my stuff and they've laid out their stuff back. And we've had this brilliant interaction. And it yep. was like people who I'd normally have small talk with I'd, I'd have like a genuine little bond with. Right. And like out of those 10 people, or for example, say I sell 10, 20 people, mm. there's only one or two who sort of went, oh, all right, um, fuck. Well, I'm, I'm uh, really sorry to hear that, mate. Obviously, yeah. I, I know I've got like one or two. Yeah, yeah. Do you know would, what I mean? They and, would draw from it. Yeah. And, you know, A, all right, fine. Mm. B, they've not had someone like that happen, so they can't relate. They don't understand. Mm. Whatever. Mm. Like, but but that would be worth it for the eighteen people who've gone. Fuck, here's my shit. 100%. Like, there's your shit. Here's my shit. Fucking, mm. let's have a big hug. Let's yeah, yeah. and and even like a two three minute chat turns into something that's actually made your day a little bit better. Yes, you yeah. know, it's um the 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 capacity to be vulnerable is right next door to the capacity to tell the truth, isn't it? Because yeah. basically, what you did is you just said. This is actually how I feel. I'm going to tell you the truth about how I feel, rather than yeah. rather than lying about it. Um, so you've got that understanding of the importance of vulnerability. You're an emotionally literate man. You understand psychotherapy. Why do you think the character that you've created and that you love the most is such an insensitive, rigid dick of a human? <laughs> <laughs> 
And I love him. I mean, yeah. I would I would totally hang around with Troy. I am Troy in it's, many ways. But. It's so it's a kind of like it's high status that is actually I'm presenting high status, mm-hmm. but it's not obviously. Okay. I'm presenting a high status that is a low status. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yes, that's sort of where where the the joke is. Yeah, like so. I'll I'll come out on full of myself to a point totally unaware yeah. that the audience are laughing wh- why they're laughing and what right. they're laughing at. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that that's sort of a big a big part of it. Like I, it's interesting because I when I saw you um I, I I saw you online first then I saw you live. I I thought two things that I'm certain of. This mm. guy is 100% private school educated. Yeah. And secondly, he's definitely a scouser. Ah, because there's two, th- there's there's two worlds you understand very well: the private yeah. school and you understand. I don't know. Do you get a better reception in Liverpool than elsewhere? Um, I think Liverpool crowds are brilliant. Like I've got, I'll I'll do a different set in Liverpool. Okay, so I've got a a Liverpool based set, but I've got so much fondness for Liverpool, obviously, because right. my mum was from Liverpool. Okay, and I went to uni in Liverpool. Right, I got in a band with some guys in 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 uh, Liverpool from the Wirral, yeah. and and I've stayed in touch with them sort of ever since cool. so some of my be- some of my best mates is that's that's the accent i'm getting that's the vibe i'm getting right. you know on the phone and stuff yeah um but yeah i think it's just soon as i came up from surrey to liverpool when mm. i was like 19 or whatever having been in a grammar school mm. and having grown up in surrey to then come to liverpool and get like a real taste of that culture and the people and everything i was mm. just i was a, i was like Second, I got out of Lime Street. I was just like, kind of, there's a vibe. Yeah, there's a different vibe here. to this place. There's yeah. a vibe to certain places. Like, yeah. like there's a vibe. Like, if you go to Ibiza, mm-hmm. um, not the San Antonio part. What's the other part called? Playa del Bosa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a vibe. Like it's it like there, yeah. Brighton as well. Brighton's yeah. got Brighton's yeah. got the same thing. And Liverpool, not not that vibe, but yeah. a a thing. A, a it's got a unified flavor, doesn't a, it? And an, uh, an identity in the air, where mm. however the fuck you put it, mm-hmm. which I've always felt like a kind of a low level sort of excitement. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Because yeah. one of the reasons why was, because I, I, obviously I went into my own head. Uh, first of all, you can do a Scouse accent, yeah. and most people can't. When they try and do it, it sounds like Craig from Bit to Start going, I think Scouse is yeah. talking. People horrible. won't believe I'm not a Scouser. They won't believe. No, no, people, I've, I've had chats with people, they've gone, no, mate, you're a Scouser. Yeah. You know? Because I'm it, not having it, you know. Because I'm it's like, right. it's 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 um, it's not because most people think it's it's in the sounds that you're making, but it's your whole body has to move <laughs> from your toes, from the way you bounce. Everything has to to be scouts. It has to be yeah. the whole thing. Translating English into scouts, part one. Arguments. Oh, come on, stop it. Don't you even think about doing that in my presence. Yeah! Oh, you've done it now, haven't you? Despite what I presume are better instincts. Aw, oh, hey! How could you have even contemplated this course of action? I'm beginning to question your logical thought processes here. You what? Through some vivid contortion, I've gazed into my own physical hidden misery. And those grisly, unwashed depths adequately sum up my opinion of you at this moment. I saw me ass. And with the private school thing, I was like, okay. The, so... Scousers, it's left leaning, generally yeah. speaking, it's working class, proudly working class. But I've always felt like there's a secret love of posh people, even though they'll say they don't. And I'm like, you've you've understood. That oh, well, that's Troy, that's that, a, an accident. Like right. that's that's not pure accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I I think I think it's a happy accident. Yeah. Um, because um, as much as there is this like anti elitist sentiment in in the whole of the northwest. Yeah. Southport, through the world, North Wales, wherever, and Liverpool. There is also like um, a fondness in a way, for, maybe for the enemy, fondness for the enemy, for that pompous, eaten, educated public school boy, if he's there. So instead of attacking that I person, think Boris has probably put paid to that, though. Do you think so? Oh, my God. <laughs> he's killed it, Stoke. But All like, that goodwill it, is gone now. It is. The more you look into it, the more it's like... This this dude, mm. whatever talent he's got, mm. has basically wrangled the whole country buying into his sort of infantile Winston Churchill fantasy. Yeah. And it's it's like everyone's an unpaid extra in his little 
feature film of his masturbatory sort of fantasy. And, and everyone's just realizing now how the fuck, how the fuck have we, we bought into this, into this, like that. And most people didn't obviously, but just the levels of trickery and manipulation and, and sort of, Oh, it's, it's, it's just fucking sickening, isn't it? Like, I, I bought into it. I thought he was um, I, a, a genius playing, playing a bumbling buffoon to sort of oh, put yeah. people on the like, back foot. Like, like uh, yeah, lowering people's expect. There's that yeah. line in um, Scream. It's one of my favourite lines where Dewey says to Courtney Cox's character, maybe I'm acting like this as a subtle form of emotional manipulation to lower your expectations of me, thereby enhancing my ability to maneuver effectively in any given situation. Did you ever think about that? Like, and that's fucking mm, yeah. Boris to a T. And yeah. there are articles that have come out five years ago that mm. people are now putting on Twitter going, this is what he is and this is what he's going to do and you're yeah. on fucking idiots. Right. Amen. Got yeah. Done. Right. Yeah. That There's that like Nostradamus of 2016 <laughs> going, this guy's a, an absolute weapon Yeah. and you're buying into it and he's, he's worse than useless. You know, and and do you think that that on in his on his part, well, it can't be a lack of IQ, can it? No, it's not a lack of IQ. The guy has clearly got a, a stunning level of of, of ability mm. that could have gone in another fucking direction. Mm. Like I don't know what he would have done. Like yeah. been a a promoter or an agent or I don't know. Yeah, like a, anything. You know the, what I mean? the raw IQ is there. Like he's born with, obviously with, with smart. Obviously, yeah. you you don't get to to get there. Yeah. If you're a complete fucking idiot, <laughs> so that's almost even more insulting. Because he's like he's got all this IQ. There's no excuse. He's got all this IQ, but he's not yeah. putting it in the right places, is he? Yeah. He's not. Yeah. He's not using it. Yeah. All that IQ he's got for the for the best will of the country. It's getting swallowed up by whatever immediate egotistical, selfish, fucking in the moment needs he's got or something. Yeah. The guy's yeah. obviously mad, clever, yeah. you know, mad able. Like you don't get there without without God knows how many mental weapons in your arsenal. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What What do you think is uh, is tripping him up? I I, I think it's pure fucking ego. I it's honestly, ego. I if I had to guess, mm. it is that Winston Churchill fantasy. It's mm. him being blinded by the fact that he's gone right. I've got my chance now, mm. me, Boris, to make my mark on history. Mm. And I'm going to be this renowned person that people are going to be talking about in the history books for, for the next eight, nine hundred years. And I'm yeah. going to, and I think it's that. Yeah. I honestly think it's that. Like, I, I don't fucking know. If I had to guess, I'd, I'd say it's that. It's pure ego. Yeah. I, th I think it's ego. I think his obsession with Winston Churchill, um, Obviously, there's hero worship and you have aspirations and you want to walk in somebody's... That's, that's all fine. But as time has gone on and I'm looking at him, I'm like, there's something a bit delusional about this. There's something a bit dangerous about this. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if everybody's aware of just how much he's really trying to be Winston Churchill. Yeah. And that, that, it's the wrong time. It's the wrong place. It's the wrong character. Isn't it, it so, so much sense. worse? If he does all, have all this raw ability mm. and a lot of this shit is just down to, I don't know, Laziness. Yeah, it's, it becomes even more horrific. Yeah. It? <laughs> it's just laziness and stupidity. <laughs> you just can't be asked. Well, it's like your 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 football team's got this incredible striker that they've paid twenty million, who's got this long contract. He doesn't give a fuck about the team, and he's just mm. arsing about. And the, but but the, the leader of the country. Oh. It's uh, yeah. It's I actually I I've, I haven't written it yet, but I've got this bit about I haven't written it out properly yet, but I've got this bit about how like. Boris Johnson's like left everybody with daddy issues. Right. Like we're not going to, we're not going to trust the next person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We're going to have all these bizarre we'll sexual disorders. <laughs> right. You know, do you want to come around for Netflix and cash for questions? <laughs> I don't know. Like everyone's going to have daddy issues now. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, where have you been doing a trade deal with Australia? Oh yeah. Who decorated your flat? I don't believe you. I, oh, I haven't written it yet. Yeah. Right. But yeah. it's, it's, it's coming. I'm trying to extrapolate that. Cause, cause like, I think a lot of guys give women daddy issues as an umbrella term for any erratic behavior mm. within a relationship mm. and, and men who have daddy issues, what do they do? They scream at their boss mm. and cry at the football, but right. that's fine. Yeah. That's men's daddy issues, whatever, yeah. but women's daddy issues. Like I think, I think women get, they get that umbrella, don't they? Yes. Oh, she's got daddy issues. Yeah, yeah. Just whatever it's, that, whatever it's, that. It's a write-off, yeah. yeah. It's just written off. Yeah. yeah. And so I want to kind of go 
yeah, this is the next bit I want to write. We, we all fucking have. The whole population. The, the entire be population of the UK now yeah. has that stepfather that's gone in your mum's wallet and fucked off to the bookies and yes. whatever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's what we're looking at as a, as a nation, as, a, yeah. as broad scale trauma and PTSD that will go on for generations. Right. It's like, gonna, yeah, narcissistic relationship. I did, a, yeah. I did a little video. It's like, it is a narcissist. Like, we've been lied to, we've been gaslit mm. by the government. Mm. It is a narcissistic relationship. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, with with all of the uh, with all of the trimmings and the and the symptoms that go with it afterwards. Mm. So I have a couple of questions um, that that I wanted to ask you as we as we get towards the end. How important do you think anger is in the comedic process? I mean, that's a. It's funny because that's that's kind of like uh, uh, that's. I, when I genuinely get annoyed on stage as Troy, people seem to love it because... I love it. I think I subconsciously give off this Basil Fawlty energy. Because <laughs> yes. it's like, it's... it's. <laughs> I don't know who's feeling the anger. Like, I know it sounds wanky, but fuck, we've been, you know. Yeah. Like, I don't know if it's... Because <laughs> sometimes something, an, a, a shit heckle, like mm. a funny heckle, great. Mm. Yeah. A mistimed heckle, whatever I can get. If it's just a shit, nothing heckle. Yeah. Like, carry on. Or something, just some like, yeah. just, ugh. <laughs> it, I don't know. There's there's some, yeah, I'll, I'll feel it go. And I don't deny it. I kind of try and ride it. Like yeah. if, if I feel that. Yeah. Um. But, but yeah, the, 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 there is, there is something about that, but it kind of has to be real anger. Like, or irritation. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think if you try and fake it, it's a bit shit. Troy, Troy's frustration and rage is absolutely hilarious to me. Obviously, the yeah. the, the posture is is back in here yeah. with the chin and the head. And then as he gets more angry, he gets stiffer and stiffer. <laughs> I don't notice that. See, see, I don't know I'm doing that. Yeah, I'm genuinely. You're, you're, you're getting stiffer and stiffer. And, and your face goes like that. Yeah. You're looking like this. Now, I don't know what you don't understand. And I'm just sitting there crying, laughing. I had teachers like that. Yeah. They weren't playing a character. Uh, that, yeah. If you asked a stupid question in class or three stupid questions, yeah. that's where they'd go to. I, I do get messages from people going, you've just reminded me so much of my dead granddad. It's untrue. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's another era, like isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, uh, if, if, you're, if you're permitted to say something wanky, I'm going to say something wanky as well. There's something archetypal about him. Mm. There's something archetypal there is. So many of us recognise parts of ourselves or parts of our grandfathers in yeah. this character, and um, I think we miss him. I think there's a there's that. I mean, we just mentioned Boris Johnson, Winston yeah. Churchill. This era of just total self confidence because now we question everything. Everything's psychology, well, self conscious, and a huge chunk of denial. Right? Huge. And yeah, huge. Yeah. I mean the yeah. It's colonialism, isn't it? Yeah, the yeah. Balls yeah. to just show up and go. We have a flag. Yeah, and yeah. This is now Britain. I mean, that's it. It's terrible. We all agree. Yeah. Crimes, you know, the the crimes, historical crimes, whatever. But uh, do, 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 sorry, yeah. Do you think the Brexit people were like, we can get back to that? Like, genuinely, we were a superpower once. We can do it again. Do you think there's an element of that? I'd have to. I mean, yes. I think like if if we go super super wanky philosophy sociology and go we may as well we've got we've gone halfway there there is a craving for a kind of there's something dom about masculinity yeah and I mean that in the most positive way sometimes you need dom like yeah. if you're going to hold the gates if you're going to win a war you're going to fight mm. a battle you need a sort of rigid stupidity to do that obviously it's terrible and can create mm. trauma and terrible genocides and everything but if you swing the other way and everything is moral relativism and everything is questionable and everything is is up for grabs and we all have a right to speak at all times on any subject. There's a kind of soup that we descend into. And I th I do think on the Brexit issue, there was the fear of the soup or mm. the, the exhaustion with the moral relativistic soup and a desire for confidence and certainty, a desire to go back to a kind of boundaried rigidity. This is who we are and this is what we do. And I think there's still a craving there for it. And I do wonder when I'm listening to Troy, if I'm getting something and other people are getting something that, oh yes, he's ridiculous and, and we find this character ridiculous, mm. but we miss him. Mm. 
Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I told you it was going to be a wanky point. <laughs> <laughs> I do think there's something archetypal about Troy. Yeah. Yeah. It's I'm um, anything like that is is an accident. But yeah. but like a happy, I guess, accident. And if you, can't, you know, unconscious. Yeah. Unconscious and happy accident. Mm. Um last two questions. Mm -hmm. What's what's hilarious about trauma? <laughs> what's hilarious about trauma? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what's hilarious about trauma? That's actually one of the things I was thinking about naming this whole interview is the hilarity of trauma because <laughs> it's such a terrible title. Um, yeah, I was thinking along the lines of... I'll tell you what's fucking excellent about trauma. Yeah. Is um, it, gives, it gives you an unparalleled sense of perspective. Like I've had the only... G -g genuine trauma in my life and I've realised what a trauma-free life I've had mm. over, I would say, from about two years ago, I'd say from about 2016 to 2020, I had a, a period of trauma for the first time in my life. And it's like, I found out who the fuck I was. Mm -hmm. I found out how I re react to those situations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realised that that I, I have a, a certain type of stamina for getting through a, a certain type of situation. I've got more empathy for people who've had similar types of trauma that I had for obvious reasons. I've got a broader spectrum of human experience. I mean, you know, obviously this is a quite a privileged view, fucking view of trauma, but it's, it's trying to take whatever you can mm. from that, that, that just, uh, I think any, any trauma can potentially strengthen your, um, strengthen you mm. it, it, through the the old cliche of what doesn't kill you make you stronger but it, it, it's it's the, the biggest fucking learning curve you can have as a person mm. is to go through any kind of trauma mm. do you know what i mean yeah yeah it's almost like the seasoning point that we were talking about earlier it, it seasons you yeah there's a sort of maturation that can come from that yeah strength that you yeah you can otherwise. there is a thing isn't there like post-traumatic growth mm. right oh, yeah you you can like um yeah, if you, I guess if you meet everything head on and, and fucking ask yourself all the tough questions, then yeah. yeah. My final question, uh, who are your favourite stand-ups of all time? Ooh, this is a, this is an odd one because I used to I used to watch stand up all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And and it was it was uh, Richard Richard Pryor, mm -hmm. which is an obvious one. Mm -hmm. Patrice O'Neill. Oh God bless you. Um, God bless Patrice. Right now, right now. Who, who who do I fucking watch now? I try not watch stand up now because I don't want to be kind of influenced. influenced or affect, uh, affected. Who who do I love watching? Who do I love watching? Um, oh, there's so many brilliant people on on the circuit right now who are just hilarious. Uh, uh, Finn Taylor, Bobby Mayer. Um, they're terrific. Who else? It's a guy called Russell Hicks. He's quite big on like TikTok, and he just does just just does crowd work. Mm. Sort of circuit guys. I've got a lot of mates who are excellent comedians. There's a guy in Scotland called Mark Nelson. He's fantastic. Uh, there's so many comics out there that people don't realise. Gareth War, Tom Horton, Elliot Steele, Kai Humphreys. They're all comics I work with who are just excellent professionals that are out there all the time, that, that, that are at that level below sort of, you know, universal recognition. So, yes. Same as me, just sort of like, just bubbling up and just getting better getting in the there. background. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. The whole time. But in terms of like big stand-ups and stuff, I do I mean, I, I, I love, I love Bill Burr. Yeah. Like, he's just, just so good. He's got that boxing style of comedy, I'd say. He can mm. put you on the ropes yeah. and he can really squeeze a laugh out of an audience yeah. aggressively. <laughs> yeah. No, definitely. There was someone else I listened to for the first time as well the other day that I loved, but I can't remember. I don't, it's it, it's it's weird. It feels like a busman's holiday. Yeah, I know. So I don't, do you know what I mean? I like, I like watching like, I don't know, reality TV and odd Korean films when I'm yep. not. I have the same thing. <laughs> people ask me about like psychotherapy books and different yeah. different people in the who I'm supposed to read and I'm supposed to watch their podcast and I, I don't 
I don't want to. It's be, work, isn't it? Yeah. You want to turn, want, turn your brain off. I'd rather go to comedy. I can brain like a washing machine all day. Yeah. Do you want to put it on a slow cycle when you're chilling? Do you know what <laughs> exactly. I mean? You want to turn the fucker off. So you're working tonight as well, aren't you? Yeah. In I got four pool. shows tonight. I got, um, I'm bouncing around. There's three in hot water and one in St. Helens. Oh, wow. Go and see the wolves. Go and see the wolves. <laughs> yeah, Fucking exactly. wolves, that lad. Fucking wolves, lad. Milo, thank you so much for coming no, in. I really pleasure, appreciate man. it. Thank you. Cheers, sir. brother.